So the unemployment rate is found to be higher for those individuals that have a higher level of motivation. Uh, in our assumption, we assume that since education can you know, like, uh, equip an individual with skills and talents, the unemployment rate will be higher for lower uh, educated individuals. That's what we thought. But when we put the data into the analysis, we find that individuals who have a higher education have higher unemployment. So this was a very developing view. Now, the unemployment rate that I obtained in my study was similar to the results of the NSS, that is the National Center Survey 68 round, and also the periodic level, uh, level 4 survey that was published just last month in the month of June, where the unemployment rate in Nagaland was 19%. So first, the unemployment is a wastage of the valuable human resources that we all And secondly, unemployment can lead to a vicious circle of low income, uh, low demand, and low production. So what you know, like when the uh, majority of the society is unemployed, what happens is their income will be low, right? Unemployed means no income. So when the majority of the society does not have income, the, their ability to spend and consume is lesser. Uh, because human beings we spend and consume according to our income. So when the majority of the working force is unemployed, what happens is the overall demand of the society is less. And when the demand or what we call the aggregate demand in economics, when the aggregate demand is less, what happens is producers will try to limit their output according to the demand. Because if there is an overproduction, there will be a falling price. In order to be, uh, you know, in order to avoid that, producers will adjust their output according to the demands of the society. So when demand is less, producers will reduce their output. And how do they do that? They reduce their output by laying off some workers or maybe firing some employees. So it, it, it again reduces the employment generation, and that will lead again to higher unemployment growth. Higher unemployment means less income, less income means less demand, less income means less production. So there is a vicious circle. And the third problem of this unemployment problem is also called social and political levels. We all know the problem associated with unemployment. All of us have some, you know, like that some period of time might have experienced a uh, problem of unemployment or might have some bodies and relatives or friends. So we know the problem is unemployment. We post, you know, like social and political levels and it also causes problems in the family, domestic problems, uh, you know, like it causes you know, uh, loss of self-esteem and dignity, so many crimes and human delinquencies that we are witnessing in the society. Some of these are related to the other common problem. <coughs> so one of the reasons why we have this high unemployment among the educated kids is because we have a disequilibrium in the level number. This equilibrium is not balanced. And why does it happen? Supposing for the illiterates, there is no unemployment, zero unemployment for the illiterates. Why does it happen? Because for the uneducated, uh, they don't have much options. They don't have much expectations that they will get a better job, right? So they will accept whatever job is available in the market. They will accept whatever wage rate is available in the market. And they will offer them that. So we don't have any unemployment in the uh, uneducated. However, for the educated, it is a different case. The educated they are choosing, they are not willing to work any kind of job. They will not just take any kind of job because the educated they are ambitious. They have a goal, they have an aim in life. And that's how they become choosing. And that, that's why when the society, the economy does not produce sufficient jobs, then they are demanded by the educated workforce. There is a disagreement. And on the other hand, we cannot say that there is, not, not, there is no job in the economy. There are jobs in the economy. But when the skill set and standard demands by the labor market, uh, when these skill sets are not possessed by the educated and employed, for instance, then the labor market cannot absorb the post uh, workforce. That is how we have a disagreement with the speed uh, in the economy. And when the demand for skilled worker does not increase with the uh, increase in the supply of skilled labor, they will be uh, disequilibrated. When we look into the sectoral contributions of the cross-domestic state, we find that the 
luxury sector, or what we call the service sector, contributes 63% to the gross domestic product. Correct? The service sector. And when we analyze the service sector, most of it comes from trade and repairs and hospitality sectors. So trade and commerce, if you look around, who are occupying the trade and commerce? It is a non dollar correct? So we cannot say that we do not have a job in the market. There is a job in the market, but it is occupied by others. And that, that is how we are having this huge unemployment problem. So the problem is maybe our uh, problem why we are not able to enter into the labor market, particularly into the trade and commerce. Might be because we like some business skills, might be because we like some management skills, or maybe some kind of interpersonal skills. Right. Uh, many other entrepreneurs you know, like, would like uh, often blame the uh, underground factions when, whenever they are unable to survive in the business. They might have played a role, but the non locals they also play great taxes. In most of the cases, they play more taxes than us, right? But still, 70 80 percent of the dividends of the trade economics is given by them. So there must be something wrong with us. The simple arithmetic skills that we learn in the schools, the simple computational uh, skills, aptitudes that we learn in the school may not be sufficient for us to be able to that problem. And maybe we also lay some kind of like, interpersonal skills that we all know, right? We used to complain whenever people do a local show, uh, we used to complain that we are not doing it very well, uh, right? So there might be some kind of uh, problems associated with their kind of information. So maybe we might need to rearrange our system in order to suit the demands of the economy. That's good. Also studies many other areas that I will not discuss in details. We are also utilize the income inequalities, the education inequalities, the impact of uh, parental education and the impact of children's education on the family. However, the alarming issue is the unemployment issue. And in order to address this unemployment issue, uh, I have identified three factors. One is the political issue. Uh, we need a conducive political environment in order for the economy to grow and flourish. Now that we have these political issues because of our uh, strife for self determination for almost 80 years now, uh, the environment, business environment, the economic environment may not be conducive for the growth and progress. So it is important that we somehow resolve this political issue. If this political issues is not resolved, uh, it is very unlikely that our economy will pick up a pace that is desired. And if we look at the central and the national level, uh, initially Government of India invested its resources in public sector undertakings. But now what is happening is that they are divesting from the public sector undertakings. Because most of the public sector undertakings approved by the government are suffering financial costs. Because of this very reason, the government is going away from the public sector. So we cannot expect the government to invest in the industry. And so the solution for us is to invite the private investors into our land, let them invest the other. But for that, we need to provide a useful environment, we need to provide a rule of law in the society, and more importantly, we also need to provide a friendlier land policy. The second is the educational policy. If we study the statistics, the data, it is found that 66 percent of our graduates, college graduates, are from social science background, what we call arts, arts education. So that means majority of our graduates come from a particular vocation, that is arts education. So this might be one of the reasons why we are having a disability in the labor market, because the demand for arts graduates may be less than the supply of arts graduates. So maybe we also need to change in our society perception, the nature of social science education. Uh, all of us don't have to pursue science education, uh, uh, sorry, arts education up to class 10 or 12. Right. There are so many vocations now. And therefore education uh, should you know, like, you know, incorporate current guidance and counseling at the global level, at the maybe at the university level. So that our students also understand the availability of other different vocations. Where which they can pursue. A person can simply obtain six months training or a one year training and get employed, get employed anywhere. Whereas a person who spends five years pursuing arts education, most of them, at least 60% of them are employed. Even the unemployment is very high among them. Uh, it's more than the uh, 15 to 29 years, 70% of the youth are unemployed. That means out of 
10 cubes, 7 of them are dark. So we are having this huge and enormous problem. And because of which, we may also need to rearrange our education policies, reframe our curriculum framework, and increase vocation studies that can benefit our students. And lastly, uh, it's an economic policy. We really need an employment generating industrial policy. The contribution of the secondary sector. Secondary sector is the industry, or what we call the manufacturing sector. Uh, so, secondary sector is the industrial sector of the economy. The contribution of this sector to the gross domestic state product is just 11%. And this figure has remained consistently in the last decade, from 2021 to uh, 2011 to 2021. Contribution of secondary se se sector remains consistent at around 11 to 12 percent of it. So this means that our industry is not well developed, and therefore we need to develop our industry. Recently, we find that uh, the government has invested resources to train our youths into the hospitality, hospitality sector and get them employed in different parts of the country and some other cities abroad. Now, this is a good policy because it will address short-term unemployment issues. But in the long term, we might need something more than this in the short-term issues. We need to invest in industries that can product, produce products uh, where we can export. We need to invest in, uh, in industries that can generate jobs and absorb our local skills and talent. Only then, only then we will be able to, you know, like, reap the benefits of the economic development. Only then the state revenue will increase and we can stand on our own feet. Of course, this is easier said than done, but this is a hope that one day we can also have a vibrant economy. With these few words, I can do my speech. I thank each and every one of you for question hearing. Thank you so much.
the discussion at the grassroots level is found one thing because I believe that we have not had the occasion of uh, launching books in Woka, of launching books which is well written, well researched and which is not based on hearsay. So this was one of the reasons why I wanted to have this uh, launch in Woka. I think we should start this culture of discussing, debating, arguing and also having informed conversations on any topic that impacts our society. And this is a beginning. One of the reasons why again I agree to launch this book is because you know he's a old friend of mine, a comrade, a dear partner in uh, understanding, reviewing and also critically it is not only based on uh, his uh, articles that he writes usually for the uh, newspapers but it's based on his research and research is different from an opinion research is based uh, research is something which produces conclusions which society can learn from and uh, in the history of the world and humanity we have already seen how politicians really need economists to explain to the masses what it, it is that uh, they drive their policy from. The underlining theme that he has captured on especially human capital in common employment in Africa and because he uh, used Wokhan's Luta as his uh, area of research, I felt it was important that, you know, in continuation of whatever he has explained today, it is important that we explain that within the context that our people will understand. And that is, I feel, the job of the politician. An economist will use various theories, an economist will use the data available and gathered and screen it from the prism of those theories, but a politician will look at it from how it impacts the policy making in the state or a country. I'll break it down for you. Number one, when he talks about uh, educated unemployment and of the educated unemployment, you know, the reasons that he gave us, I look at the other issue that he touched about how because of the insurgency the economic and we are in the business ambition of our entrepreneurs are getting affected and how that is being discussed at all level you go to any village you go to any uh, colony in Boca town also you will hear people talking about it he gave an explanation and he gave an explanation based on his studies whereas usually laymen will discuss about it from what they immediately feel so what you feel immediately is usually what drives your discussion at our society and that culture needs to be reviewed and changed by giving well researched data based studies like this book for instance he has mentioned a lot of things on that part but one aspect which I would like to add to his uh, argument is that we don't pay income tax. How does the factor in all this uh, uh, you know, assessment of the human capital income and employment situation in both these districts are here? I mean that is something you would like to maybe further uh, work on because without paying any income tax you are expecting welfare policies to reach to you, you are expecting financial support from the government and somehow that doesn't seem right. It is at odds with the general economic policy of any country or any state. So a non-tax paying state is demanding the rights that tax payers demand. So that is at odds with each other. How do we reconcile this factor when it comes to the state of life? So those are issues that I want to discuss. Now let me just get down to the uh, basic grassroots 
interpretation of what his book will be and how his book will be understood. This is from a political or a politician's uh, point of view. He has provided enough data on the uh, uh, both income, employment, number of schools, and uh, you know teachers, and how it impacts uh, society in, in terms of how uh, the number of educated unemployed are unemployed are already registered in the government, and how uh, that reflects the present state of affairs. However, if you look at the local discourse and the local narrative, for instance, I'm a politician. I represent a constituency which is uh, which has a voter of 25,000 plus. Every supporter of mine has a mindset that I should either make them poorer party, give all their children employment in government service because for our people employment means government service. So that is our uh, level of thinking. So when civilizations have progressed, when Christianity is more than 130 years in the state of Dalai, we are still thinking like we are thinking in the time that he has mentioned. In the 1950s, if you read his book, he has documented how people were resistant, not 1950s, prior to that, when Christianity first came, people were resistant to send their children to the educational institutions, to hostels, because we still believe in the Murum structure of education, Murum system of education. They were resistant because they were thinking that they would be converted to Christianity by force. Although, as he rightly points out in his book, people became Christians out of choice, those days. Only later, when statehood came, and people were getting employed in government uh, jobs that those days, those especially those who were educated, and they were bringing more income than the farmer was bringing, because all of us had that. I mean, we still had that kind of society, agrarian society. So only when their eyes opened, they started sending their children to school. When Christianity came, education came. He mentions, and it is a fact, that. American missionaries chose this to educate, to, in, to, to open institutions, schools, because only education will challenge the long health taboos, social inhibitions, our cultural, the problems in our culture, flows in our culture, which actually impeded the growth of education in us. Now, from that level, we have come to a level where we should be thinking differently. But my voter will not talk to me if I am not able to give his children or his son a government job. So we think we are too advanced because we are wearing Western clothes. We think we are too advanced because we are using smartphones. Because we are earning money today. We are not printing money but we are earning money. But our thinking is still in the 1930s. Because we don't understand how the economy works. We don't understand how the government works. And we don't understand the relation between politics and economy. So politics about policy, governance, law making, we talk about rule of law. Today, in the light of this, because this book is very relevant for the state of Nagaland today. I have read many books on, not there are not many books of course, at least three, four books which have been written on the state of economy in Nagaland. And then there are some research papers. In the past, local uh, Naga authors used to write. Uh, problem is, I get very disappointed and I stop reading when I see that for a PhD scholar, not to even know how to write proper grammar, it's an embarrassment and I immediately stop reading. Then there are uh, scholars from universities, those days it was under Nehu, so who have written books on the uh, state of economy of Naga. Now, their books have been relevant with the data of uh, those times. But today with new data and with new policy of the government of Nagaland and also for the government of India, we are uh, changing certain policies which is not working based on you know, empirical data available. 
But this is one relevant book because it is going to inform policy makers, especially when the new education policy has come in place. This will inform how the state actually looks at our uh, government policy and how it impacts our citizens. Number one, when he talks about uh, you know the number of schools, employment, and how it's related, how education is related to employment. It's very relevant. Today we have what is called the Nagaland uh, Staff Selection Board. It, it was a demand of our local educated unemployed youth. So I have documented how many unemployed youths are there in my constituency, educated unemployed. And I have also put a remark on those people whose parents supported me and whose parents are still demanding that I give their son an official job. They want no less than their son be given an officer. Now if that is the outlook of our people, that is the expectation of our people, and we want to say that our son studied very well, got good marks in uh, the matriculation, studied in good college, but now, you know, he's uh, unemployed because maybe he's not willing to give competitive exams or maybe he's waiting for some senior to give him a uh, government job, especially a white government job in the government sector. That is the attitude. Now, if you look at the whole vicious circle that he was uh, pointing, that creates a culture where you have people who have this dependency mindset. You are dependent on others for your happiness in life. And your happiness is dependent on various factors. Like I should have a government job without having to give an exam. I should have a government career in them without having to give an exam. Then I will become uh, uh, head of department and then I will make enough money. So if you have that thinking, and your children are also having the same, entertaining the same talk. Today I don't think we can discuss any political theory or economic theory in Mukha town or any town in Nagaland because that mindset is controlling our culture and our society. We cannot progress. With that our society cannot progress. So when we say what are the ills and what are the problems of our society, we don't have to look far. If you look at your own mindset and how you are thinking, you will want to attend good events. You will want to go out and attend good seminars, good uh, lecture series. You, are, you may want to send your children to the best universities. But at home, you are not doing things. So when I suggested that we have this discussion, I think this is the way. We should begin at home because unless we educate our own people on what are the values that we should cherish and we should encourage in this generation, only then can change up. Now let me just give you two, three examples. Recently, I uh, gave away awards in Dimapu for a group called Gain Concept under the PM KBY project. This is a project of the Prime Minister of India on skilling, reskilling and upskilling our artisans. And uh, this award was given to artisans who use bamboo. I was very intrigued because last year when uh, Rajiv Chandrasekhar, who is our skills minister in the union government, came, we visited this centre. We wanted to see why a small factory of this room size in Dimapur is sending out bamboo products to 14 countries in the world and to some of the biggest brands in the country by Reliance, by a very famous urban uh, elite uh, brand called Good Earth. They are buying products from Dimam. And these products are made by our artisans. Usually, mostly from uh, home district. So they are trained, retrained. I mean, it's repurposed for uh, the clients that order. 
But I was shocked because usually our products don't go far. The only famous product that Nala produces are Nala food, which is sold in every petrol in, in the country now. But that is a very, very small, uh, you know, in terms of scale. But if you look at this particular group, K concept, today I was telling them all the Nala officers or Nala business people will buy Christmas decoration from Marangari party in India, spending thousands and thousands of them. Now this Kain concept got an order from America to make bamboo stars and bamboo de decorations for Christmas. They are no longer ordering from China. They are ordering from India but from Dimapur. And they are not you and I. The artisans are hardworking people. They value hard work. They value dignity of labor. They don't think that making a bamboo or cane product is for lesser mortals. Now they are earning in dollars. So I was telling her, why don't we have this? I mean, this was a pilot project. Why don't we have the same concept in every district of Nagaland? Where instead of them, the artisans coming will go, we'll train them, the ministry has money to give them, and we'll ensure that all these products can be sold at good market. Now, here, this is the problem of even our agricultural uh, products. Marketing and finding a market is an issue. In my constituency, we have a lot of uh, organic products which are sold in Assam. But usually, sold through middlemen at a cheaper price. And the middleman man profits more than the actual producer. So, here, in this case, our uh, proprietor there, the uh, entrepreneur, Jasmina Zilian, has been in this sector for the longest time. She is also in the sector skill council in the Ministry of Handicrafts and Carpets. She has found the market linkage. So our artisans no longer need to have to worry about where they will sell their product. They will just have to link up with uh, the cane concept and they will sell directly to the uh, agency who wants to buy. Abroad and also other parts of the country. So the other aspect of this is beauty is that she has already had the market linkage you won't have to worry about transportation or other logistics second thing is making bamboo products is part of our culture we make the bamboo basket we make many things out of bamboo here it's just a little repurposing you are upskilled in the sense that you you already have skills but you have forgotten it because you know there is no such education in the schools on teaching you how to make bamboo baskets but they will train you and using simple uh, machines you will be able to employ again people from your own district or locality or village and uh, for Lothas you can employ people from your own clan also since we give so much priority to clan if you want it that way but they will be earning money on a global scale and this is the vision of our Prime Minister where he wants that what is part of your culture today is the market elsewhere. So if you train yourself, relearn the skills that your ancestors naturally had, it's easy to find a market. So that is something which government is already doing. Now on the other hand, issue that you start upon because you know like I was saying earlier it is good for a country because an economy is writing a book doing research on our society and our economic situation will explain to people in a better way more articulate manner based on uh, data and medical evidence and it will make our job easier for us so therefore based on the issues that he has touched today for employment we are very happy that Nagas are moving forward from that kind of dependent mindset to a competitive mindset. I'm all for reservation. I want to give reservation to everybody. But if we want to progress, meritocracy is the only way forward. You may want to become an IAS officer for another youth. 
but you have to compete with uh, lakhs and lakhs of people who are doing so well in their studies also. Only then, among the few, among the many that goes through mains exams, you will, only one will succeed, or few will succeed. So that is meritocracy. But here, whether you deserve working or not, by virtue of your birth, by virtue of your tribe status, there are reservations. It's good. Affirmative action is good. But to what end and to what extent and up to when shall we promote that? For Nagas to compete with the rest of the country, meritocracy is the only way. Competition is the only way. Depending on your politicians should stop. Now, we should discuss politics on the basis of what is our right as a community, as a constituency, as a village. What is the way forward? What do we want? Actually, do you want a society to grow or do you want only the individual which is you to grow? So these are thoughts that we need to discuss every day. I was talking with a friend of mine who asked me about Woka and what are the major social, religious, political issues that are gripping uh, you know, Woka as a town or as a district. So I said, look, we are also going through those uh, renaissance periods where Martin Luther King, John Calvin stood up and said there are certain practices of the Pope in the Roman Catholic Church that needs to be reviewed and discussed. I think it is not a crime to discuss. I think it is not a crime to argue. It is not a crime to review because only when a society reviews it, although in our case sometimes it becomes violent, it becomes very personal, it becomes very petty, it becomes very divisive, if we actually debate and argue and have and leave room and space for negotiation, will the society grow in all sectors? So that's one example where I felt that today we should start the conversation among ourselves. We should have this conversation in Woka. We should have this conversation in all the sections. Therefore, for the past Five months I've been coming every month, two times or one time to go. Every month. I will sit with people and I will discuss because I want to know what is it that drives some people to blindly, obstinately hold on to certain position, idea or thought. Why is it that our only method of having a conversation is by opposing or taking an opposing view? What is it that Lothas were known to produce great scholars, great leaders are not progressing as a society? Why is it that we only want to fight each other? Is that the way you want to be? Is that the future you want for your children? I think we need to take a step backwards. We need to relearn the basics. We need to focus on what is what rather than who is saying what. I think for all this, it is a good beginning and therefore I readily agree when he called me for this. I readily agree. Because today we have a book in hand which is based on data, which is based on empirical evidence, which says that in your school you want good matriculation result, but you have only five students whereas you have 10 teachers in the government school. In your school, you are not saying anything. You are turning a blind eye to your village education or school management committee when they give NOC to the teacher who is keeping a proxy teacher in your village. It should start from our village. It should start from the grassroots. If it doesn't, we are a society of hypocrites. Because we are not ready to face our reality. Today, we have a book which says that your language is not acceptable to us. Your language is not the language that our future generation will be speaking. Because you are still thinking about yourself. You are still thinking that our politics should be driven by how many jobs that politician is given, giving. How much money that politician is giving. If that is the basis of your understanding of politics, let us not have this one. But if we really love our people, if you want to grow as a society, I think this is a good thing.
today, with due respect to the author, in conclusion, I want to say, we have come because we are his friends. Some of my friends have also come to see that this book is released, that this book launch is important to him as well as to all of you. But it is really important. Therefore, I have come. Therefore, I have come. But my challenge is to all of you, don't just sit and and leave. My challenge is if all of you read this book, around 70, 80 people work, then we have something to have a meaningful conversation in our kitchen based on the data he has done. One fellow's hard work is offered to you in a form of a book. For you, it is just one day's work of reading which will ensure that you become better citizens and that you are part of the new future that my generation of leadership wants to take our people forward. With this, I want to congratulate him for this meaningful work that he has done it is a small book, but it is the first, most, single most important book that is produced by one of our finest economists in the state of Dhaka. Thank you. Oh, so the Nia Chan, Naga Chibo, also, and Naga Yuta, and Naga Chumre, Marin Dong to the book. Gako Mopa Dera Majicho, also Zanga, also Hakato, the Tengi Nins. We Motolia, also Bengadari, a football boy to the Gajesa, or to Zoro, you know, Natsika, or some cheap Solia, or poor for the Randanoji Chica, or poor for the dog when you come to Uga. Vanjo Chica, one more sorting, you talk to Uga, Randanoji Bencho Chica.